them glory and honor. They all belong to you. Thank you, Jesus, for blessing me. I just want to praise you forever and ever and ever. For all you've done for me. Oh, well, blessings and glory. And honor the Thank you, Jesus. Yes, for oh, blessing me. Oh, I just want to praise you forever and ever and ever for all you've done. Oh, 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 blessings and glory and honor all belong to you. Blessings and glory and honor belong to you. Blessings and glory. And I'm not to you. blessings and glory. And I'm not to you. Blessings and glory. And to you. For blessing me, for blessing me. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We just want to thank you for all the blessings that you bestow upon us. God, there's sickness. There's death, there's unrest, there's uneasiness. Father God, just be you. Grant healing where you see fit. Grant comfort where you see fit. Continue to extend your grace and mercy to all of us, Lord. But we all fall short. But God, we're just thankful that you are careful to look after us, to take care of us, even when we don't even say thank you. So God, as we come tonight to prepare to learn more about you, we ask that you open our hearts and our minds, that we would be receptive to your word. Thank you for this pastor who continues to study and listens to you to deliver to us. These and so are the many blessings we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, let's give the Lord another hand clap and praise. Come on. Thank you, Deacon Gates. Thank you, Lady A. Thank you, musicians, for lending your gifts. Set the atmosphere. We greet you tonight with Jesus' joy. And as always, we are grateful and we are thankful for this another opportunity God has given us to assemble ourselves in his house and to delight ourselves in the study of his holy and his righteous word. We want to give God praise for our young people as they head off to their Bible study tonight. Let's celebrate God for their faithfulness. We're grateful and thankful for those of you who are in the room and for those of you who are joining us by Zoom tonight. We are grateful for your presence as well. Amen. Tonight, I'm going to hit the ground running. Amen. And so yeah, we are few of us in the buildings, but we are in the building and that's all, that need, all we need. And I'm grateful 
Tonight, we're going to hit the, hit the ground running talking about counterintuitive Christian as encouragement in God. Counterintuitive Christian or Christianity um, as encouragement in God. I want to begin tonight's lesson by inviting you to go back to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians. It is a passage of scripture we looked at last week. I want to build on that scripture, but I want to first remind you of what it is that the Apostle Paul went through in 2 Corinthians. That was a catchy tune there. I'm sorry, it's still rolling around in my head. Give myself to everything. <clears throat> Second Corinthians chapter eleven is where I want to begin. If you all remember, we've been talking about the counterintuitive life of a believer and how it is that we are to live contrary to common sense, and that is really more inclined to con contrary to what is common. And so tonight, I want to remind you, I want to build on 2 Corinthians chapter 11, and it is there that we looked at the life of the Apostle Paul, and more specifically about how it is that the Apostle Paul began to suffer for the cause of Christ, or suffer for the Lord's glory. Y'all remember? And, uh, and so um, I want to begin there, just to set our hearts. Um, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning verse 24, we, we hear of the resume of Paul's suffer. That he, according to verse 24 of the Jews, was five times he received 40 stripes, save one. Three times was he beaten with rods. Once was he stoned, once he suffered shipwreck, a night and a day he had been in the deep. In his journeyings, he often in perils of water and perils of robbers and perils by his own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren. Verse 27 says, the byproduct of all of that left him in a degree of weariness and painfulness in watchings often, in hunger and in thirst, in fastings often, in cold and in nakedness. If we would continue reading, you'll see that he went through several things of that nature. Are you with me? But if you look at verse 30 in that passage, you'll see that his disposition about what he went through is different than what is common to most. Because many times when we go through things of that nature, it is our objective to be gloomy, to be sad, to be beaten, to be defeated in our disposition. Why? Because of all of the things that we've gone through. Wouldn't you agree with me that that's the tendency of humanity, that when we go through something such as these things that are listed, it isn't our tendency to walk away from those things and, well, not to be worried, but to be happy. That's contrary to our disposition. What we find Paul do in verse 30 of this text is he says these words, he says, well, let's just read. He says, beside those things, I'm in 28, that are without that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. Now he's got occupational challenges. He says, who is weak? And I am not weak. Who is offended? And I burnt not. Verse 30 says, if I must need glory, I want you to catch this. I will glory of the things which concern Mine infirmities? I'm going to glory in the things which concern my infirmities? Not the things to which I've been victorious, not the things to which I've gained victory over, but, but I'm going to glory in the things of my infirmities? That's, that's quite contradicting to the common way of responding to conditions such as these. Are y'all tracking with me? Then he says, these, this is in verse 30, he says, 
um, the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is blessed forever more, knoweth that I lie not. So he gets, he says, God is a witness that when I go th went through what I went through, I could have, what's this, been in despair, I could have concluded, but I didn't. I lived, what's this, counterintuitive to my condition. And I did it boasting, bragging in my living. Are you with me? Now, I want you to know Paul is, is exceptional. And we know as it relates to human nature, he's an exception to the rule because we are quick when we are beaten. We are quick when we are in perils to cry gloom, despair, and agony on us. In fact, the impact of such perils in our lives often leave us in the condition, not that we find Paul boasting about, but more so that to which we find Jeremiah expressing in the book of Lamentations. That being said, I want you to go to Lamentations chapter 3. Because you'll find that the book of Lamentations is, is written by the prophet Jeremiah. And it is a very emotional book. You're praying with me? You'll find when you read the book of Jeremiah that every verse reflects Jeremiah's weeping condition. That is why we call it the weeping prophet. Not because of his prophecy in the book of Jeremiah, but more so of his weeping in the book of Lamentations. Now, his weeping is engaged as a, as a direct result of what's happening to him and his people. Because his people is in what we would consider a Holocaust type disposition. And as a result, those that, that are oppressing them has as their objective death and destruction. And as a result, we would consider that a tragic disposition to be in. Are you with me? Unless Jeremiah, however, and I want you to know, Jeremiah goes through some stuff. I'm going to look at what he goes through. I'm going to read a little bit of scripture today because, well, this is Bible study. <laughs> Uh, and so I want to begin in Lamentations chapter 3, and I'm going to read, and y'all travel along with me in your Bibles, electronic devices, whatever it is you study the Bible from. You ready? Listen to how, how pitiful a situation, calamitous a situation that Jeremiah and his people are in. He says, I am the man that hath seen affliction by the rod of his wrath. He hath led me and brought me into darkness, but not into light. Surely against me he is turned. He turneth his hand against me all the day. My flesh and my skin hath he made old. He hath broken my bones. He hath builded against me and compassed me with gall and travail. He hath set me in dark places as they that be dead of old. Y'all still here? He hath hedged me about that I cannot get out. He hath made my chains heavy. I want you to take note, he shifted from being in a condition before where he just was, was bound, dead, but now he's bound. He was in darkness, but now he's bound. He's in a bad way, but now he's bad way and bound. Are y'all tracking? Watch the progression. He says also in verse 8, when I cry and shout, he shutteth out my prayer. Even I don't, I'm not church worship ain't helping. Are you with me? He, he hath enclosed my ways with hewn stone. He hath made my paths crooked. He was unto me as a bear lying in wait and as a lion in secret places. He hath turned aside my ways and pulled me in pieces. He hath made me desolate. He hath bent his bow and set me as a mark for the arrow. He hath caused the arrows of his quiver to enter into my reins. I was a derision to all my people and their song all the day. 
He has filled me with bitterness. He has made me drunken with wormwood. He has also broken my teeth with gravel stones. He has covered me with ashes. And thou hast removed my soul far off from peace. I forgot prosperity. Look at me. How many of you think that this is a bad disposition to be in? In fact, what I want you to do is I want you to compare this disposition to the disposition that the Apostle Paul was in, in 2 Corinthians. Because both of them are in bad ways. Both of them are suffering affliction. Um, but they respond differently, Lady A. Paul responds in boasting. But Jeremiah responds initially in weeping. And who would blame me? I wouldn't. I mean, I I, I wouldn't I wouldn't blame him for, for crying in a condition such as this, Holocaust. But what we're gonna learn is that Jeremiah turns, listen closely, his tragedy into a triumph of faith. I, I want you to get that. Jeremiah weeping in these Holocaust type conditions turns his tragedy, tragedy into a triumph of faith. Let's keep reading. Verse 18. He said, and I said, my strength and my hope is perished from the Lord. Now look at me. The way we're going to see Jeremiah turn tragedy into a triumph of faith is by two things. The first thing he's going to do is he's going to recall God's consistency in his past. That God has never failed him in his past. Y'all got that? There's going to be a test later. The second thing that he does is he, he recalls, right, that God's promises remains faithful. Two things. These two things is how Jeremiah, in a weeping condition, turns his tragedy into a triumph of faith. Got it? I want you to know that's a shifting disposition because he's crying and he has reason to cry. These things bring about tears. However, he does not allow the conditions or his own weeping keep him in a disposition separated from his God. Y'all tracking? He lives counterintuitive to his condition. He even lives counterintuitive to his emotional state. How does he do it? I told y'all about 15 seconds ago that there would be a test. How does he do it? He remembers God being faithful in his past, right? God, God has never failed him in his past, and God's promise is faithful. Got it? Okay, all right, let's keep reading. I want to go back to verse 18. Listen to what happens. As a result of his condition, as a result of what's going on in his life, he's in a weeping disposition. He feels like, listen, I, I deserve all of this. But in verse 18, he turns, watch this, on God. Not only does he turn on God, he turns on God Watch this. Not conversing with God, 
but conversing with himself. He has an internal dialogue about his condition. Are you ready? Watch what he says. And I said, my strength and my hope is perished from the Lord. Got it? Why did you say that? Next verse. Remembering my affliction and my misery, the wormwood and the gall. Now, if you listen to that, you'll find that verse number 19 is a, is a synopsis of all the things we read from verses 1 down through 17. Are you with me? So those things have had impact on him. Not only have they had impact on him, they've had impact in him to the regard that now as he thinks, all he's thinking about is his condition. Are y'all tracking with me? His condition has gotten the best of him. And so now it's talking to him and he's saying, listen, verse 18 again, my strength and my hope is perished from the Lord because of his afflictions, his misery, his wormwood, and his God. Verse 20, he says, my soul, let the house say my soul. Now we've shifted to a deeper, watch this, a deeper place of position. So I was teaching this morning. Um, I, I told the morning class that you can compare this to an individual who's had such experiences that now they talk to themselves as a result of those experiences, their intrinsic dialogue. Now those experiences are not just something that's rolling around in their head. It's set up in their very essence. Because when the Bible refers to, to the soul, it is referring to your very essence, which includes your mind, your will, your intellect, your imagination, and your emotions. Are y'all tracking with me? So here he is saying, watch this. My mind is dominated by my condition. My will is dominated by my condition. My intellect is dominated by my condition. Y'all with me? My emotions, we know as emotions are dominated, right? And my imaginations are dominated by my what? Condition. So my condition has consumed me to the regard that now my very essence is dominated and I now define my existence by my condition. Y'all talking to me. To the regard, watch this, y'all. To the regard that I now humble myself. I am, he says, and it's humbled where? In me. Th those words mean I am now defined by my condition. Are y'all tracking with me? And he's weeping. Verse 21. He says, this I recall to my mind. Watch this. Therefore, have I hope. Uh-oh. Okay, see, let me paint the picture. With him and his people under Holocaust oppression to the regard where every aspect of his existence is now consumed by that condition, that even now his own thoughts are dominated by that condition. He is in depression. He is having mental anguish. Are you with me? He is consumed by it. Are you with me? And he is at the point where his misery is getting the best of him. To the regard that he wants, he believes God has allowed this. And then he has the unmitigated gall to say, under that kind of oppression with tears in my eyes, this I recall. What do we just learn? We just learned that it doesn't matter how bad the condition may be. You still have an ability, watch this, to think your way out. Now, I was teaching this morning, this is, came to me, that, that this, is, this is what I call mustard seed dialogue. Because most people in the magnitude of such a condition as this ain't got much left. But do you realize all you need is what you got left? Are, are you understanding what I'm saying? All you need is whatever you got left. 
Because the fact that you got something left is saying something, but I don't want to get ahead of the rest of my lesson. Are y'all understand what I'm teaching you? Now, what's important is what you do with what you got left. We have the tendency, um, and I kind of picked on the sisters, but I'm on. We have a tendency when we get in this kind of condition, you know what I mean, where the external circumstances oppressed us, then we not it's not internalized. All we want to do, right, is stop by the nearest ice cream place, get a guy an ice cream, crawl up in the bed, put on something fuzzy, sit there and go Netflix crazy and soak. Are y'all praying with me? It, it, listen, amen, ouch, whichever apply. Lady A, ouch. Um <laughs> Why? Because, because watch this. All we feel like we can do, right, is take it. But the weeping prophet says to us in the book of Lamentation, he says, yeah, cry. But with your tears, recall, I'm in verse 21, to your mind, because if you can do that, you can have hope. Do you realize that your hope is access through your recall? Y'all not listening to me. That means you got to go, watch this, back beyond the problem. Are you with me? Back beyond the condition and begin, watch this, and not only go back there, don't be going, go, don't be going back to see when it started. Oh, I'm teaching better than y'all shout. You, you, you don't go back to see when it started. You go back to see who was there when it started. You don't believe me? So how did I say you look at me like that? Look at verse 22. <laughs> he said, I, verse 21, he recalled. He said, what I recalled is, it is of the Lord's mercies. Oh, that we are not, what? Consumed. Don't you miss it? Don't you miss it? Because if you wake up in the morning and receive a new mercy in the midst of a lamentation a situation, you only receive the mercy, not so that you can get up and recount how bad the misery is in your life. You, you get the mercy so you can have time to recall that it is of the Lord's mercy. Watch me, y'all, that you are not consumed. Can I make it plain? The objective of those who oppress the Israelites and Jeremiah was that they bring down upon them death and destruction. But yet Jeremiah, having had all of these things happen to him, still has enough time and enough, watch this, power within him to recall to his mind that it is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed. In other words, I should be dead. I should be gone. It should have took me out. It sh I should, by now, it should, listen, listen, I should be wiped out by now, but I'm still here. Yo, yo. I'm still here. Right? As weak as I am, weeping like I'm weeping, down as I am, I'm still here. Watch this. And I'm here because of the Lord's mercies. Are y'all tracking? All right, let me keep going. It is of the Lord's mercy, 22, it is of the Lord's mercies that we are consumed because his compassions, what? Fail not. Watch this. They are new, what? Every morning. Now watch this. This is an invitation to a discipleship that is reflective of the counterintuitive life of a believer. Because the counterintuitive life of a believer, the mere fact that you're a believer means you're going to suffer some things. Are y'all with me? You're going to suffer some things because you are a believer. But you cannot respond to the things the way others who suffer respond because you're a believer. You have something that others don't have. And that something gives you the ability, watch this, to, to, to hope against hope. Y'all are mighty quiet. Gives you the ability to look at the situation and say the situation looks like it has the capacity to wipe me out. But because of who I am and whose I am, I can believe beyond the circumstance because of my relationship with God. You with me? No, watch this. Watch this. Watch this. Watch this. Every morning. Oh, y'all missed it. You see? I can do it every morning. Ooh, wait. That, that, means, that means I don't have to believe today for next week. 
I can just believe today for today. Yeah, I can go to sleep at night and wake up the next morning and remember that it is of the Lord's mercies that I am not consumed. Are y'all understanding? See, part of our problem is we have a, y'all ready? Sunday to Sunday or Sunday, Wednesday to Sunday, Wednesday relationship with God. We only focus on him right, says, when we got to come to church, y'all are mighty quiet. But if you focus on him every morning, every morning you're going to be reminded that what the enemy planned for your life was not successful over your life. And all you had to do was to live day by day to experience your victory. Are y'all understanding what I'm teaching? Okay, 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 okay. I don't want to get too, too excited. I'll run with this. He says, it is of the Lord's mercy that you're not consumed. Every morning. And this is how he capsulizes his reflections on the Lord's mercy that come every day. He says, great is thy faithfulness. Are you with me? Now, y'all know the song. Y'all know the hymn, Great is Thy Faithfulness, right? Do you know the story behind it? The story behind the hymn, Great is Thy Faithfulness is that there was this man whose wife and children went traveling. As they went traveling, they discovered, he discovered that they died. Everything he loved. When they asked him what his sentiments were as a result of the crisis that he had experienced, his response was, great is thy faithfulness. That's the hymn. Do you not know that the hymn, I gotta go. Do you not know that the hymn was penned after Lamentations? Y'all are mighty quiet. So in order for him to come to the conclusion that great is thy faithfulness in the condition that he had just experienced, he had to have visited the book of Lamentations and came up with the same conclusion that Jeremiah came up with. That it is of the Lord's mercies that we're not consumed. Are y'all understanding? Y'all understanding what I'm teaching you? Great is thy faithfulness. That's significant. Why? Well, I'm, I'm trying to try not to get y'all throwing me. Y'all pulling on me. Y'all really are. Y'all pulling on my spirit. I'm trying to stay to the text. So he says, great is our faithfulness. Verse 24, he says, the Lord is my what? Portion. All you got is the Lord. Of all you got, all you got is the Lord. Oh, who of, did y'all hear me? Of all you got, all you got is the Lord. He says, the Lord is my portion, saith, watch this, my soul. Now, remember, we just read that his soul was in a, in a, in a condition to where he felt what? Go back a few verses. I don't want y'all to miss it. Go back to verse number 20. His soul has misery compartmentalized all throughout it. Misery in his mind, misery, misery in his what? Intellect, misery in his emotions, right? His soul. But here he is a couple of verses later, after he what? Recalls, yes, sir. After he recalls, what does he recall? The great is thy faithfulness. Now let's go back to the beginning of the class, lest you miss it. There were two things. God has never failed him in his spirit, in his past, and God has promised to remain faithful. It's right there. You hey, open book test, right there. Right? Y'all with me? That's what he remembers. Watch this. That's how he turns. Did you catch it? The way Jeremiah turns tragedy into triumph of faith is through the recall of those two things. Are you with me? Okay, good, good, good. Your enthusiasm is overwhelming. I just want to make sure. Here we go. All right. So let me let me let me finish this. So he says in verse 26, I'm gonna stop at 26. He says. The Lord is good. No, I'm 25. The Lord is my, 24. The Lord is my portion, saith my soul. Watch this. Therefore, did you get it? Will I what? Hope, right? 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 No. Look at the text again. Hope in him. Because let me tell you, watch this. A hope, let me, let me put it this way. A belief toward the future 
and the re end results without him is just wishful thinking. Oh, yeah. Did, did you catch it? If, all, if I base my expectation of future success and future reward, right, and don't base it in him, all I'm doing is wishfully thinking. Y'all with me? But when I put it in him, uh, did, uh, did y'all get that? I don't want to leave nobody. Did y'all get that? If I put my future success and, and, the, and the outcomes and the rewards of my life, for future, and I don't put them in him, all I'm doing is wishfully thinking. But when I put them in him, now I'm hoping. Oh, are y'all getting me? That's why the hymnologist said, my hope is built on nothing less. Y'all get me? Y'all been singing these songs, didn't know what they mean. All right, y'all got it? It's gotta be what? In him. Not in money, not in cars, not in other people, not in this company, that company, or another company, but in him. You can't, watch this, you can't turn your circumstances of misery and mayhem that threatens death and destruction. Watch this, wishfully thinking. You got to put your hope in him. Y'all got it? Now, any questions on that? That hoping in him, right, is how you, watch me, y'all, encourage yourself. David says, I would have fainted. Lest I believe to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. If I didn't, watch, watch this, y'all. If I didn't believe that this, this, this lamenta, this lamentations disposition, right? And these afflictions that Paul referenced. If I, if I believed that that was it. For me, but when I looked at them, something on the inside of me said, this was not greater than God. David says, I would have fainted. The word faint that translates died. I would have let it take me out. Unless I believe to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Some times you have to encourage yourself. How do you do it? I told Joan this morning, or maybe I need to tell Shay, you don't you don't go shopping. That's not how you do it. That all them bowls of ice cream ain't gonna do it. Are you understanding? Because what we have done right, is redefined what it means to be encouraged. In fact, we, we've, got a, we've got a bunch of unsuccessful anesthesia for our discouragement. Are you understanding what, what I'm teaching? We just learn how do we encourage ourselves? We remember. What do we remember? The faithfulness of God in the past. And, and faithfulness of God to what he's promised. So if my condition, right, if my condition, maybe you just can't, I was just singing to you. Okay, my, my condition, y'all ain't got no sense. If my condition does not reflect what he's promised, then my condition is an opportunity for me to what? Turn my tragedy into a triumph of faith. I do it by recalling what God has what? Done in the past and what God has promise and that's got to be enough to what take my discouragement and bury it in encouragement now my condition is what it is 
But I don't live according to my condition. I live how? There's a word I'm looking for. It's the series we in. Yeah, there you go. Counterintuitive. <laughs> Counterintuitive. Am I making sense? Now, what I'm showing you is what is the what is the motor of the counterintuitive life? Okay, let's keep working. So, lady, you got I need you got a mic? Good. You got your Bible? Yeah, okay. So, so we're gonna do some reading because it's Bible study. All right. I want y'all to go in your Bible to Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 4. If you attempt, watch this, to encourage yourself, but not encourage yourself in God, you are not going to have what you need for what you're going through. And that has been the trick of the enemy. The trick of the enemy is to get you to find encouragement in a source that's not God. Because if you look for encouragement in a source that's not God, you are not hoping in God. Are you tracking? Isaiah 40, 31. Lady, you got it? You sure? All right, read it for me. Uh-oh. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. So if you read the passage correctly, you will find that there are three conditions. Watch this, y'all. There are three conditions that these individuals were accustomed to doing, right? They that wait upon the Lord shall what? Renew their strength. If, it, if, it, if it's renewed, then they lost it. They ran, right, and got weary. They walked and fainted. Are y'all with me? Those are the conditions. Now watch this. The reason they did that was because they did not wait. The word wait there in its original language is the same word that we find hope as. Are you with me? It's as if I, I did this analogy this morning, right? The bus schedule says the bus is coming at noon. So you sit there believing the bus is coming. Are you with me? You're sitting there and the bus doesn't come at noon. Somebody comes by and says, you want me to take you home? Mm, no, I'm, I'm going to wait on the bus. Now, you're waiting having had the bus not come when you want it. Are you with me? But you're still waiting because you believe that the bus is going to come. Some other folk come by and say, I'm going to pick you up, want to take you, take you home. You say, no, I'm going to wait. Are, are you tracking with me? Finally, the bus comes, right? And you get on the bus because you what? Waited. But you waited in hope that the bus was coming. Right? The bus came. You get on it. You're traveling down the road. You see the friends who wanted to pick you up. They're in a car accident. They're piled up. You're in the lane. The bus comes through. Cop says, y'all come on through. As you go past them, y'all missing my analogy. As you go past them, you recognize, had you not hoped, you'd have been in the condition. Are you, are you understanding my point? Let's keep teaching. Right? So hope, watch this, strengthens. There are too many people, too many believers who deal with hope and watch this, and they're, and, they're, and they're really frustrated while they wait. But the reason they're frustrating, watch, frustrated while they wait is because they are not hoping in God. Am I making sense? Go to Job or Job, whatever one you want to call it. Job chapter 14. You need a job, you can go to Job, chapter 14. Y'all tracking with me? So you encourage yourself in God by waiting on God. And that strengthens you. Don't wait on God. Don't complain about being weak. You chose the weakness 
when you decided not to hope in him. Ooh, can, ooh see, he whispered this to me, so I'm going to have to say it. This is to my single sisters. Don't get weary waiting. What you hoping in? You got to have, never mind, I'm going to do that long. We're going to do singles conference one day. Hold on, just, just, yeah. Hold on. All right, she said, hold on, Sister Cleveland, hold on. Jesus. Wait, I say on the Lord. Y'all come on back. You in Job chapter 14? Read verse 7 through 9, lady. For there is hope of a tree if it be cut down. Hold up. Hold up. That, ain't, that, that don't make no sense. <laughs> that don't make no sense. There's hope of a tree if it be cut down. Go on and read the rest of it. For there is hope of a tree if it be cut down then it will sprout again. Hold up. That don't make no sense. There's hope of a tree if it be cut down that it will sprout again. That makes sense? Mm -hmm. That don't make no sense to y'all. Don't act like it do. Cut down trees become firewood. Huh? Depends on how you cut it. I'm not finna listen to y'all. Keep reading this text. But there is hope of a tree if it be cut down then it that it will sprout again uh -huh. and that the tender branch thereof will not cease. Uh -huh. Though the root thereof wax old in the earth and the stock thereof die in the ground. That's the stump. Go ahead. Yet through the scent of water, it will bud and bring forth bows like a plant. Okay, so I wanted Sister Bostic to understand that the tree was cut down. Right, if you read that, what, what do you read? What translation is that? Yeah, one, 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 one translation talks about that the stump is grounded into the ground. So it's grounded. It, the stump is gone. Stump been removed. Tree been cut down. Right? But yet there's hope that it'll grow. Yeah? No? Not now? I'm so glad you said not now. Read that verse again, Lady A. For there is hope of a tree, if it be cut down, that it will sprout again. And that the tender branch thereof will not cease. Ooh, the look on her face right now, that don't make no sense. But listen to what it says. Go. Though the root thereof wax old in the earth, and the stock thereof die in the ground, yet through the scent of water it will bud. Now, watch this. The hope for the tree that's been cut down, grounded into the ground into the ground. His roots are waxing old in the ground. The hope is in, that, is in the scent of water. The root system determines whether it grows or not. Not whether or not it's been cut down. Okay, maybe you're missing it. So if I had time, I would go over to Psalm chapter one, right? And where it talks about the tree planted by the rivers of waters that bringeth forth its fruit in its season. That tree is planted by rivers of waters and it's no surprise that it's bringing forth fruit because it's planted by rivers of water. What makes the fruit is the water. Y'all miss me, y'all are Baptists. Y'all were supposed to shout right there. What makes the fruit is the water. Are you understand? The root system takes in the water, and as a result, the water begins to flow, and as a result of it, the tree, the tree bears fruit. Are y'all making am I making sense? Over here at the cut down tree, Sharon, ain't no rivers of waters flowing, but at the scent of water. Are you understand? Hope and faith are based in the water. I told him this morning, told him this morning, y'all, 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 y'all ain't enthused as they were this morning. But I told him this morning. You don't even have to be planted by water if you've been cut down. Just little boy, let just let a little boy walk by with a pail of water. Because what's it? It starts the growth process not when it receives the water, but at the scent of water. 
That's what hope is. I ain't got to have no water. I can be in a pool. God, I got to go. I can be in a parched land. Are you understand? But all I, all I need is a whiff of water. And that's enough hope to cause me to begin the process of growing into a tree again. Are y'all understanding? Well, I, I think this is important. I'm, I'm, I'm going off script here. But I think this is important because we serve in a, in, in a society where there is a dominant force, Satan, who loves to steal your ability to hope. You understand? So the message is you don't need a lot of hope. You just need the hope in the right place, in him. Y'all getting it? So hope produces even after destruction. Hmm? Hope produces even after destruction. Let's go on. First John chapter three. I'm showing you how to encourage yourself in God and why you should. First John three, verse three. You might, this might as want to read. Okay, that's a no. I was gonna give you fifty dollars. You just... And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. Now watch this. So this passage implies that when we hope, hope serves as a filter. Right? It serves to purify us. From what? Take a stab at it. Our condition. See, we have the tendency to take our condition, internalize it, let it define us, and then let it drive us. But this passage says that as long as we stay in the posture of hope, that hope will begin to purify us. Where? Where was Jeremiah? His misery where? In his soul, in his essence. So you begin to change your essence as you begin to what? Hope in him. You understand? You sure? Say hope purifies. Doesn't matter the condition. Hope purifies. There's hope in him. All right. Oh, watch this. Um, First John 3 and 3 also says that the purification process is such that at its conclusion, you're purified as Christ is purified. As he is purified. So, so that's, that's the result. Complete purification. Making sense? It's the difference between tap water and Fiji water. Okay. I was trying to... Just... <laughs> There's a difference. I'm trying to tell y'all. It ain't bougie water. It's purifying. All right, First Peter chapter one. Y'all, y'all tracking with me? Are you all tracking with me? You getting this? First Peter chapter one, verse thirteen. Wherefore gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end of the grace that be that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Go back and read that again. Listen. Wherefore gird up the loins of your mind. Stop. There is the place of your hoping. If you can push the essence of hoping to the content of your thinking, that's what he's saying. Gird up. Yeah, the conditions are what they are. The lamentation is what it is. The objective of the adversary is what it is. But for you, you are not siding with that. You're, you're hoping against that to the regard that it's now purifying you, strengthening you, and watch this. What else? girding you up. You're being internally strengthened. Am I making sense? Now finish it. Or start it again. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end of the grace I'm, for the I'm grace. Sorry. I'm sorry. I just heard this. I didn't, I didn't hear this this morning. He said, gird up the loins of your mind. Watch this. Be sober. 
Now, sobriety, right? We understand what sobriety is. It is counter to intoxication. Are you with me? So he's saying that if you allow your condition to consume you, it is the equivalence of you being of intoxication. And he says the way, God Almighty, the, the, the way you alter that is you what? Hope and hope and hope until you are strengthened. Are you with me? Okay. All right. Keep going. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now watch this. Say hope to the end. Hope to the end. So you hope in God and you hope to the end. You don't stop hoping, right? You don't stop hoping until you see the conclusion because there's a conclusion coming. Now watch this. The conclusion, according to this reading, is a revelation. Are you in the text? The conclusion is a revelation. So if it is a revelation, it is something beyond the condition. It's something beyond the condition, but it's in alignment with your hope. So you do not look at your condition and say gloom, despair, and agony on me. Let the weak say I'm strong. And the poor say I'm rich. And even if you've got to weep in your poverty, you understand? Weep, but don't lose your hope. Y'all hear me? Because there's an expected outcome. I got a question from Sister Harden. Who would have thunk it? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Are y'all tracking with me? Y'all understanding what I'm teaching? <laughs> okay, not really a question, but a comment. This means we should never be, a, we should never get so far into, um, our poor pity me and our conditions and our situations that we allow ourselves to be destroyed or, or consumed by that. We should always, if we have that hope, if we are in God and we are hoping in God, we have to always remember what he's done for us in the past in conditions and brought us out. We should never allow ourselves to get to the point where, where we stop or, or where this takes over, because if you truly believe in hope, you you pull yourself out of it. Now watch this. Now watch this. Yes. Simple answer to your question is yes, but I want to show you something. When we fail to do so, what we do is prioritize the condition above our belief in God. Okay, right, right. Are you with me? So we should be able to look at what's happening to us, even if we... Like I'm just using me. If mm -hmm. I get something, something's happened to me. I'm having a bad day, and I'm depressed, and everything has got me down, and I'm just boohooing and crying. At some point, I'm gonna look. Sometimes I look out my window and like a tree, and look up in the sky, and something hits me and says, "Lord is with you." You know, and yes. you start remembering. Okay, yes. I've been in this position before. Yes. He brought me out of this. Yes. Snap out of it. Yeah. Now let me ask you a question. To eat and go on. So she said, give me something to eat because you got to have eat with God. No. All right. Now watch this. Watch this. Watch this. Watch this. Watch this. You said you start remembering. See, that's the problem. Because what are we talking about? We're talking about the counterintuitive nature of the believer. Right. But as 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 humans, we have that tendency. Uh uh. See see see. There you go. Don't talk to me about being humans. Okay. Well, or because when you say no, when you say listen to me, when you say as humans, you have already adapted to the world. You've accepted that nature, and that's not what you do as a believer. What is it that comes over you when you allow that to get you down? Whatever is happening. So, so, so what's this? So, so I'm a, she ain't going to let me answer the question. Okay. No, I'm just teasing. I'm just teasing. What is it? Here's what it is, is a lack of discipline in who you are as a child of God. It's a disposition that you should be in, not a if or. See, the only reason you are losing hope, who are you hoping in? God, 
So when you take your mind off of who God is in you in your life, you're going to lose your hope. When you remove God from the experiences of your living, you're not going to have hope available to you. You're going to start wistfully thinking. Jesus said, now you got me stirred. Jesus said, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Well, why you got him walking us alongside you and you depressed? It's, it's our disposition. We are not, we are not, watch this, we are not innately driven to live counterintuitive to the common. That's what we're, but that's the objective of God for our lives. We don't go, oh my God, do you see what's going on? No, we go, what does God want me to do here? Mm -hmm. Right. Because remember, because the conditions provide the opportunity for counterintuitive living. Then what is it if, okay, like I said, I'm going back to me again. If I'm of in this depressed state and then my brain, you know, I my brain wakes up and I, so is there such a thing as subconsciously you're always in God? And because um, you know, if you know there's hope and you know God, you know there's hope and you know there's no reason for you to be wallowing in this. So let me ask you, if you know there's hope, why aren't you hoping? Yeah, but I mean, but but what is it that sometimes gets you so much that you, you know, a second or two for a minute or two, you are con you are in bound by whatever. I'm going to answer the question. Okay. Again. <laughs> Listen to me. Listen to me. Let me. Let me. Let me. <laughs> let me. Let me go somewhere that I didn't go this morning, but 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 Sister Harden is taking us there, so we're going. No, no, no. It's okay. It's okay because I want you. No, no. Don't be sorry because this this is what we're here for. Right. So, um, and you don't have the notes for this, but I'm going to give it to you. Right. You've heard, you heard Jesus say, you're in the world, but you're not of it. What does that sound like? Counterintuitive existence, right? Part of the problem is we don't believe it. We don't accept it. And so we are guilty of what Romans 12 says we shouldn't do. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. God's will is that you not be in misery, it's that you be in victory. And if we believe that, then what we do is, watch this, the only way we can get there is to continually live counterintuitively to the regard that our counterintuitive living becomes our way of life. It's continuously. So if you got to start out with hope laws, hope back, hope, hope, then do that, right? But don't make, watch this, don't make in hope and out of hope living the way to live. You have to make that the, the trajectory to get to the place where I, my hope is built. Am I making sense? Now, that's the, ch y'all got me in some stuff I don't really want to be in, but that's the problem, watch me y'all, with having a religion and not a relationship with God. Because through a religion, you can have your hope in a book, you can have your hope in a church, you can have, but unless you have, watch this, your future resolves in who? In God is just wishful thinking. And many people live their lives wishfully thinking. Let me ask you a question. This whole, I'm in trouble now, so I might as well go and stay there. You got people who live their lives on the trajectory of being successful. I'm going to be successful. What if God don't want you to be? Huh? So you're going to be successful if God doesn't want you to be? Probably not. Except you redefine what success is and claim it for yourself, which we do in society. You y'all you, you understand what I'm teaching? So the trajectory is to come to the realization that I live my life in God for the purposes of God. And as a result of that, I don't live my life in accordance with the world. 
I'm transformed by the renewing of my mind. So what other people look at and say, I'm poor, I look at it and say, that's an opportunity for God. God wants to do something with that poverty. God wants to do something with that sickness. If y'all if let me run to the close, you're going you're gonna to see it clearly. Y'all with me? Let's go. We, let's go to, y'all understand, hope empowers you through to the aftermath. Got it? Go to Ephesians 1. You got it? Who got it? Who got the mic? Now you got to read Ephesians 1. Ephesians 1, verse 18 and 19. 18 and 19. Ah, uh, yes. Ooh, we, y'all know I'm over my time. That's okay. <laughs> okay. Um, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward to okay to toward to usward who believe according to the working of his mighty power? I don't have glasses. On. That's okay. All right. I'm gonna just let that pass. What's, I couldn't. What's usward? Toward us. Toward us. Toward us. Ephesians 1, 18, 19 says, hope sets God's outcomes, right, as our expectations. So when you hope, hope strengthens you, it produces after destruction, it purifies and empowers you through the aftermath, and hope sets God's outcomes as your expectations. You can have an expectation that's not God's outcome for you. But when you hope in God, it causes God's expect outcomes to be your expectations. Did I catch that? Got it? You changed the Yes. 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 Because you're hoping in him. So you're now expecting what he desires. Y'all track it? Let me do this last piece because I don't want to come back to this lesson next week. So I'm going to do this. Go to 1 Samuel chapter 30. Now, let me tell you what's going on in 1 Samuel chapter 30. Right? David has come home and some men have ransacked his home, have taken his wife and his, his wives and his family, his children. Right? That's what's happened. Now, if that if you go home and your and that has happened to you, what's going to be your disposition? Right? You, 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 I'm sorry. Speak up. You might be happy. I guess it. that's because you ain't got no husband and no children. Okay. So anyway. All right. I don't know, man. I don't, I don't know. Um, I'm going to have to have a conversation with God about getting y'all to heaven because y'all don't act right. Y'all don't act right. Let's, let, me, let me get back to my lesson so I can go. I didn't know y'all turned into pumpkins at 8.05, but anyway. First Samuel chapter 30, watch what happens, right? I'm in verse 8. So David gets home. And I want you to notice the first thing David does after this condition, after he comes home and, and this calamitous circumstance has occurred in his life, right? The common response for us is to be enraged, right? Call the police, go chasing folk, right? Let's call it what it, David does this, verse 8. And David inquired at the Lord. Hmm? First thing he did was consult with the Lord. Your wife gone, your kids gone, your house gone, all your stuff gone. Let me pray. Right? Thank you. Thank you. And David inquired at the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue after this troop? 
shall I overtake them? And he answered him, what? Pursue. Look at me. All he told him to do was pursue. For thou shalt surely overtake them. David didn't ask you that. David asked, shall I pursue? The response is, pursue and no, you shall overtake them. And without fail, what? Recover all. Now, what am I sharing with you? That his, his inclination to consult with God concerning his calamity, not only did he get an answer, but he got information about the results. Are y'all tracking with me? Now. My struggle is with your word first. He went to God. Right? He went to God. Right? Now watch this. Because, because your hope is in him. Got it? Okay. So David went, he and the 600 men that were with him came to the brook Bezor, where those that were left behind stayed. But David pursued. He and 400 men, for 200 abode with behind, which were so faint that they could not go over the brook Bezor. And they found an Egyptian in the field and brought him to David and gave him bread, and he did eat. And they made him drink water. And they gave him a piece of a cake of figs and two clusters of raisins. And when he had eaten, his spirit came again to him, for he had eaten no bread nor drunk any water three days and three nights. Verse 13. And David said unto him, To whom belongest thou? And whence art thou? And he said, I'm a young man of Egypt, servant to an Amalekite. And my master left me because three days gone, I fell sick. Now, the people who have invaded David's house are the Amalekites. Brian, what do you do with this guy? <laughs> you, you come home, you did caught one of them. What do you do with this guy? All right, let's keep reading. Verse, 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 four, verse 14. Listen to this, Brian. He says, this is the guy talking now. We made an invasion upon the south of the Cherites and upon the coast which belongeth to Judah and upon the south of Caleb and we burned Ziglag with fire. Ziglag is where his house was. What do you do now? And David said to him, Canst thou bring me down to this company? And he said, swear unto me by God that thou will neither kill me nor deliver me into the hands of my master, and I will bring thee down to this company. Now watch. He has a personal escort to those individuals who has burned down Ziglag and took everything this man has. Look at God. <laughs> I'm going to leave it right there. Verse 16. And when he had brought him down, behold, they were spread abroad upon all the earth, watch this, eating and drinking and dancing because of all the great spoil that they had taken out of the land of the Philistines and out of the land of Judah. What are they doing, y'all? Partying. What are they partying with? His stuff. Good. Watch this. Verse 17. And David smote them from the twilight even until the evening of the next day. And there escaped not a man of them. Now, 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 this is the David. I'm out yet. Save 400 young men which rode upon camels and fled. Verse 18. And David recovered all that the Amalekites had carried away, and David rescued his two wives. What's wrong with that verse? No, it's not.
If it said two modern wives, I would have agreed. What else is wrong with that verse? Come on, y'all. What's happening in verse 16? They're partying. What are they partying with? What does verse 18 say? He got his stuff back. He got he recovered all his stuff. How does that happen? See, look at you. That's the same thing I was thinking. So how, how can you say he got all his stuff back if they're partying with his stuff? Let me tell you something. Watch this. Come on. Don't leave me. Don't leave me. And David recovered all that the Amalekites got your attention now, don't you? Like, okay. All right. And David recovered all that the Amalekites had carried away, and David rescued his two wives, and there was nothing lacking to them. Neither small nor great, neither sons nor daughters, neither spoil nor anything that they had taken to them, David recovered all. There it is again. Y'all with me? Listen to verse 20. And David took all the flocks and the herds which they drove before those other cattle and said, this is David's spoil. Now look at what David did. David got everything they took back. Yet they consumed it. How? The better question is, why? Because watch this. Don't miss it. Recovery with God is always complete. Even what they took and consumed, he will supply. Because it is not possible for God to bring you into a partial recovery. Especially, don't miss this, y'all. Especially when you consulted him on what to do. That, but that's not all. I'm closing. That's not all. Verse 20 says, not only did he get all of his stuff, but he got all of their stuff. That's recovery with interest, y'all. Because that's the byproduct of the counterintuitive life. Are y'all getting it? When encouraged in him, not only does he not fail you, he's the God who will bless you. Y'all understand this? I'm going to leave it right there for now. Question? What did he say? <laughs> didn't he? Didn't he? Wait a minute. From sun up to sun down. All right. Are there any questions, Gio? Up? Let's pray, y'all. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, for how you've encouraged us by teaching us to be encouraged in you. Lord, we pray that through continued prayer and further study that we will nurture the seed of this word so that it will be, will be made manifest in our lives. We don't want to be hearers only. We want to be doers. We thank you for loving us enough. Send this word unto us. You, you declare in your word that your word would not return unto you void. That doesn't mean that your word comes back to you. That means the Lord, when we hear it, we begin to reflect it and you receive the glory from it. So we thank you, God, for how you're working in our hearts and our minds through this word. Father, we want to pause and ask your divine blessings, your hand of comfort on the Allen family, on the Battle family, on the Woods family. We pray, oh God, that you would, Lord, give us the words to say to comfort the family on Friday. Show us the deeds, God, we need to be about in order to provide some sense of comfort of your presence in the lives of those who are going through it. God, we thank you. We know that you hear our prayers and you respond faithfully. You always have, and we know you always will. God, for other matters that perhaps have not reached our attention, but certainly have not escaped yours, we simply ask that all of heaven's blessedness and bounty be made manifest in the lives of those who stand in the need, those who need a touch, those who need prosperity, or those who need provisions, those who need healing and wholeness. We ask God touch and bless their lives. Continue to bless our church with your presence, Lord, with your plans, and Lord, with people who are committed 
to you first and foremost. As we prepare to leave this place, we ask that you never allow us to escape your presence. And God, as we prepare to leave, we certainly pray for the peace of Israel and the peace of the land. This we pray in Jesus' name, and all in agreement would say, amen. And, and, and tell Sister Susan, don't call me about the extra time, because she's going to do it.